And we thank you all for tuning in, whether it's on Crowdcast or our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. In these awfully strange times, we're thrilled to be able to present virtual editions of our programming and use live streaming to create a kind of digital stage that can serve Town Hall's community of curious and engaged Seattleites. Folks from well beyond Seattle too, we're finding. Like everyone who's willing to stare or talk into their computers now, some for the first time, I wanna thank Rich Cordray for helping us keep the conversation aloft here at Town Hall. To view a closed captioned version of tonight's program, please watch from our YouTube page. Rich will speak tonight for about 20 minutes. After then, I'll come back to pose your questions drawn from those submitted in the ask a question field at the bottom center of your screen in, uh, in Crowdcast. You can also vote on which questions our speakers answer first by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that Rich will be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. And 20 minutes is not a long time, people, so you'd best get to work. Upcoming events include uh, Dar Jamal bearing witness to the end of ICE, New Yorker editor and Pulitzer Prize winner David Rode with the true story of America's deep state, a co-production with our friends at PCC's Farmland Trust on climate change and farmland in King County, Clifford Thompson on race and family, as well as Michael Shermer, Frank Wilderson, Welcome to Night Vale, Kirk Bloodsworth, Sister Helen Prejean. We're adding tons of programs nearly every day, it seems, as well as new events being released as podcasts. And many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. So in short, you can poke around our media tab on the homepage and over the coming weeks, Town Hall will continue to provide not only ways to stay plugged in in the present, but plenty more rabbit holes for you to climb down from our recent past. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Civics at Town Hall is supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and it's truly our members who make this place possible. I want to thank all of our members, nearly 6,000 of you who are watching with us tonight. Actually, let me rephrase that. We have nearly 6,000 members. I don't know how many members are actually watching us tonight. Uh, meanwhile, everything you've heard about the present moment is true. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large are facing significant financial strain right now, along with so many other sectors. And we hope you will consider a gift during this difficult time by making a donation uh, through the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member. You can also make a donation online or by texting Town Hall to the number 44321. That will open up a page to give as well. Meanwhile, our partner booksellers have been hit hard by the ne negative effects of the COVID outbreak, and they could use your support as well. If you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores and, of course, deepening your understanding of tonight's topic, we hope you will consider purchasing a book using the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Third Place Books. Okay. As I looked at tonight's uh, bio, I realized it sort of works backward in time, and I didn't really take the time to change that. So, working backwards. Richard Cordray is at the present a lawyer and a politician and he was previously the Democratic nominee for the governor of Ohio in 2018. And before that, he served as the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau from 2012 to 2017. Prior to that appointment, Cordray served variously as Ohio's attorney general, solicitor general, and treasurer. In 2008, he received a Financial Services Champion Award from the U.S. Small Business Administration and a Government Service Award from NeighborWorks America. Earlier in his career, Cordray was an adjunct professor at Ohio State University College of Law and served as a state representative for the 33rd Ohio House District, was also the first solicitor general in that state's history. Earlier still, Cordray was the editor-in-chief of the University of Chicago Law Review before clerking for U.S. Supreme Court Justices Byron White and Anthony Kennedy. Rich Cordray's book, Watchdog, How Protecting Consumers Can Save Our Families, Our Economy, and Our Democracy, is the subject of tonight's timely talk. Please join me in welcoming Richard Cordray. Thank you, Ware, and thank you to everybody at Seattle Town Hall for making this format available during these challenging times. I'm glad to have the chance to be with you uh, virtually and to talk about uh, my new book, Watchdog. Uh, Watchdog is a story that is very timely to our society today. Uh, and to our economy today. And as we move into another financial crisis, we need to brace ourselves for a lot of the same types of problems that we had seen before. The book is about consumers. And who are consumers? Consumers are all of us. Every one of us is somebody who goes into the financial marketplace every day and makes decisions and makes choices. And it's out of those billions of decisions that we make every day that the economy of the United States of America, the most powerful, the most affluent economy the world has ever seen 
uh, has its has its uh, activity generated. Uh, now, when I started the book, I wanted to start with some stories about average consumers. That is, you and me and the people we know, our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, uh, sons and daughters. Uh, and what I want people to understand is consumers often fa face challenging situations and they sometimes get into problems that are not of their own making. Some of those problems are of their own making, but there's many situations where people are misled or cheated or mistreated in the financial marketplace. And I start with a variety of those. I'm talking about people who are using products that we all use, like credit cards, like auto loans, if you're buying a car or a truck, like mortgages to buy a house. Very few people buy a house with cash. Some do, most don't. Student loans, an increasingly prevalent fact of life for so many families across this country trying to finance higher education for their children or their grandchildren. And people run into problems and they often are stuck. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn. They often find that when they're dealing with large financial companies, uh, they get no response or they get the runaround and they often can't get satisfaction. And that is alienating and creates a sense of disrespect that is widespread. We all know those feelings of being on hold for long periods of time or being told nothing can be done about that uh, for this or that reason that's often buried in the fine print. So that's the nature of consumers. It's important for us to realize that we're not alone in facing those challenges. Sometimes you may feel you're the only one who didn't understand that or the only one to whom this happened. But often what's happened to you is part of a pattern of what happens to people all across. Should I start in talking again? 
Hi, Richard. This is Josh from Town Hall. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. If you want to just pick up where you left off, that'd be great. Okay, I'm not sure where I left off that people stopped hearing me, but uh, let me start. Okay, so I'm going to resume at this point. We had technical difficulties for a moment, and I may be repeating myself slightly, but one of the important things for people to realize is consumer finance has dramatically changed in the last two generations, really since World War II. There was very little credit available to our grandparents. It wasn't a big part of their lives. They didn't face a lot of risk. They couldn't get into a huge amount of financial trouble. But in today's a society, fast forward two generations, credit card spending is pretty ubiquitous among Americans. Uh, auto loans are a big part of people's lives in any part of the country where people uh, drive to work. Uh, mortgages are the way in which we buy houses and they are a significant obligation. And student loans are now a, a very prevalent part of life for many families and people can carry those loans for years, even for decades. So people have a lot more opportunity that credit provides, but they face a lot more risk and they can get into more trouble. So this is a bigger piece of our lives. This brings us to the financial crisis of 2008, uh, which was caused by widespread irresponsible and predatory mortgage lending uh, that caused many families to lose their homes uh, during that crisis and really up upended the entire economy. That led to congressional reforms to try to prevent that a crisis like that from happening again. And it created as part of that reform an idea an idea that had been put forward by then professor, now Senator Elizabeth Warren for a consumer agency to protect consumers in the financial marketplace. Her very straightforward analogy that was a winning argument for many was that we have gotten to the point in America where it is basically impossible to sell someone a toaster with a 20% chance of bursting into flames and burning down their house. But it is entirely was entirely legal to sell them a mortgage that had a 20% chance of putting them into foreclosure and putting them out on their streets with their families. That, that we weren't providing protection for financial products was a huge oversight. And the financial regulatory system in Washington was really focused on the big banks and the financial companies themselves. It was about keeping them safe and sound. It was about making sure that they prospered over time. That's important. It's important to remember that's a type of consumer protection too. If your bank goes belly up, it's not going to be good for any of the customers. But at the same time, it was important for everyone to turn around 180 degrees and look at the customers of these institutions and realize that if they were mistreated in the marketplace, something was wrong and we needed to redress the balance and rebalance the marketplace so that consumers had the protection and support they need in order to flourish. If we have strong consumers in our society, we're going to have a stronger economy. And again, it was mortgage lending, a consumer finance market that broke and upset the economy uh, and, and hurt us so horribly uh, in 2009, 2010. So this book is about consumers and the problems they face. It's about consumer finance and how it has changed. And it's about the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the role and importance of the work that it engages in to protect people across America. Now, something that's important to realize is as consumer finance has expanded in our society, so has the position of the financial sector. Uh, financial services have become a much bigger part of our economy over this period. They really doubled in size. Uh, and we now carry, it's a staggering figure, almost $40,000 per person of consumer debt in America today. And that means that the financial services industry has grown in clout and might and importance, especially in the corridors of power in Washington. There is more money spent on lobbying. There is more money spent on campaign contributions by the financial industry than by any other part of our economy. And so when you have a new agency, a little agency uh, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, whose mission is to make sure that it oversees the financial companies and holds them accountable for mistreating their customers, there's bound to be significant pushback. And there was. I tell some of the political story in the book. Uh, at, at first of all, the, the fight uh, that preceded my time in Washington over creating the agency in the first place. And then the secondary fight that developed over blocking the first director of the Bureau, which turned out to be 
me as the first nominee, I was blocked from being confirmed by the Senate for two full years while they battled over trying to weaken the agency. And then I come back to that fight later in the book in, in part four, where I talk about what it was like to serve for almost a full year under the Trump administration, where I was continuing to push forward the agency as holding financial companies accountable for their misdeeds. And the new Trump administration had a deregulatory mindset and was really at odds with me. And I talk about some of the battles that we had back and forth over the course of that year and efforts that were made to have me fired or have me intimidated into not doing my job the way I saw uh, and understood that, that job to be, which again was to rebalance the marketplace and give consumers a louder voice and a bigger uh, role uh, in the economy. Let me give you an indicative story from the book. It's a story about a young service member named Ari and his father. Uh, Ari went into the service and he went to basic training and like many young service members, he was leaving home for the first time and he was going to be on his own for the first time having to manage his own finances. Those people are, are ripe targets and financial predators know it. They realize that these are often unsophisticated, naive, inexperienced consumers, but they have a guaranteed paycheck from the U.S. government. And what you'll find is that predatory financial services congregate around military bases. This has been heat mapped around the country. Uh, and it's been described as like grizzly bears next to the stream when the salmon are coming upstream to spawn. Uh, and they will try to sell service members high cost loans, high cost products, uh, especially cars and trucks, especially electronics. And this is what happened with Ari. He wanted, like many young people who were on their own for the first time and now making money, he wanted to buy his first set of wheels. And so he went out and he found a lender that looked like a very legitimate lender called Miles, the Miles Lending Program, which was military installment loans and educational services. Sounds very legit, doesn't it? Uh, and when he walked out of that uh, lender's uh, show place, he had bought a used Dodge Ram truck. It was costing him 70% of his take home income. And some of that was undisclosed fees, which is against the law. Some of it was misleading add on products that were basically worthless, but he was charged for those and that was folded into the price. He didn't understand that it was all in the fine print. Uh, but that was what he was saddled with. And for years to come, most of his take home pay was gonna go to pay for this, for this truck. When he was deployed to go overseas, he turned his finances over to his father and kind of confessed and explained his situation. His father was outraged at what had happened and tried to undo it. Uh, but when he tried to work with the lender to have the loan changed, he was asked, didn't Ari sign the paperwork? Well, yes, he did. Case closed, that was the end of the story, or so they thought. And for many people like Ari, he was stuck. His father, though, didn't let it rest at that. He complained to everybody he could find, and eventually he found his way to this newfangled agency he'd never heard of called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and he filed a complaint with the Bureau. Our folks investigated the complaint, and they found the undisclosed fees and the misleading add-on products where he was deceived in the marketing of those products, and we brought an enforcement action and we found that the Miles Lending Program was a nationwide string of lenders, and the same thing had happened to 50,000 other service members, not just ours. And we brought an enforcement action and recovered millions of dollars back for uh, the consumers who were harmed by that uh, and reformed the terms of their contracts. So we fixed the problem for Ari and 50,000 other service members. That was the kind of good work that the Bureau did holding these lenders to account. But it went even one step further, and this is something that only government can, can do, is to understand a pattern of a problem and figure out how to fix it. What we did was we found that Ari had been told that he had to have the loan be repaid out of his military salary through the allotment program, which meant that the lender got their money before it ever went to his account. He had lost control of his own budget and he could not prioritize some other payment that month if he preferred this had to be paid out first. 
The allotment program had been created years ago as a convenience for service members when they were deployed overseas. This was before the advent of online banking, which is now so easy and convenient and is typically free at most institutions. And debt collectors had begun using the allotment system as a one-sided collection tool, requiring young service members to sign up to have their loan repaid through the allotment program. They didn't even realize that was an option. They didn't understand that was something in the fine print. And we went to the Pentagon and they created a task force and worked with us and they ended up reforming the allotment program to make it uh, illegal to use the allotment program for high cost electronics and auto purchases for service members. So that's a story that is indicative of what the Bureau could do uh, by providing the muscle and having the insight and being able to analyze markets. Ari thought he was the only one with this problem. He wasn't. There were thousands, tens of thousands of others who were affected. And there was a broader systemic problem that could be fixed here. And my point in the book Watchdog is that the Consumer Bureau is emblematic of what we can do with government when government isn't focused only on those with clout and those at the top uh, of the pyramid. When it's focused on middle class and working class Americans and understands their problems and the problems of the average American household, uh, we can put Americans first, put consumers first, and see to it that they get a fair shake. That's something we need to do in society today, and it's how democracy works. And that's a sample of how it is that I say that protecting consumers can save not only our families, families like Ari's, not only our economy by strengthening consumers who are the backbone of, of our economy in, in, in this marketplace, but also democracy by giving people a stake and having them understand that government can actually do something for them, make things better for them. And it's the kind of structural change that we could use across the entire government to make our government as good as its people. So I'm gonna take a break there and just pause and open this up to questions and answers. I'm sure you have a lot of questions and you can talk about anything you'd like uh, including how the current crisis uh, affects consumers. It's something that I've been talking about a bit around the country or anything from the book or anything uh, that I've said tonight. So uh, have at it. Where? Josh, you gonna bring me up? Josh, you gonna bring me up? Hi, where I'm having trouble getting your video. Okay. And you might need somebody communicate. Okay. Okay. I think I think we're waiting to bring where there's right. where on the line okay. to uh, handle questions, and I'll handle answers. Sounds great. Uh, let's see. Our first question. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, it comes from Kevin. Do you, oops. Sorry, I'm a little discombobulated. Do you think there's a way to change the perception um, of financial per, uh, protection as a zero sum battle against business interests? where for consumers to win, businesses must lose? Yes, and in fact, I talk a lot about this in my book. The reality is that when you create even-handed oversight of the market as a whole, and you provide more protection for consumers, there's somebody else who's getting a big advantage here, and that is law-abiding businesses who are trying to do the right thing by their customers, but often have to compete against other businesses that are willing to cut corners and even violate the law to get an advantage. What happens when you're a, a, a better business, if you will, as the Better Business Bureau has that slogan, uh, who's trying to do the right thing and suddenly somebody else has an advantage over you by breaking the law? You either break the law with them to level that playing field or you lose market share to them. This happened a lot in the run up to the financial crisis. There were responsible mortgage lenders who were losing out to irresponsible predatory mortgage lenders who would mislead customers about what a teaser rate was and whether that rate would remain over the life of the loan, or they had other products that allowed them to sell higher cost mortgages than the uh, borrower really deserved. And, and yet uh, the traditional lenders, credit unions and smaller banks were losing market share to those people. So better oversight of the market, better law and order in the market, if you will, actually serves the businesses that are high road businesses who don't have to compete against those who take the low road and undercut them. That's one way in which this is important. Another way is, especially coming out of the financial crisis, 
we needed to restore confidence for consumers in the marketplace. They needed to understand that it wasn't a rigged game. They needed to have confidence about what they were doing and whether they were getting a fair shake. And if people don't have that confidence, often they won't participate. An example of that is remittance transfers. These are international money transfers, people sending money overseas, often to loved ones or to family members. If people don't have confidence in that market, if they don't think an error will be corrected or dispute will be resolved or the terms will be fair, then they'll end up packing the money into suitcases and taking on trips with them and bearing all the risk of that and it creates a black market. But if you create confidence and a good sensible set of rules that's even handedly enforced in the market, it's better for the market as a whole. And it's better not only for consumers, but for the businesses that take the long view and that serve them with strong customer service. So that's an important point, a great question. I'm actually gonna stay with another question from Kevin. Um, do you have any concern that the high interest rates being charged by collection agencies and permitted under state law, like uh, 12% for instance in Washington, are abusive when prevailing rates are now so low? Yeah, I think those are abusive rates and actually it has to do with the clunkiness and the sort of uh, sluggishness of legal changes in our society. The interest rates that can be charged should be keyed very directly to the going market rates. Right now, 12% is a vestige of a time when interest rates were much higher and it is an unfair rate in a, in a situation where the average market-based bank account is paying you 0.05%. Uh, and so that's, that's just an unfortunate aspect of the laws. They need to be more nimble. They need to be kept up to date. Uh, and that's wrong. But by the way, that 12% interest rate, which is high and no question about it, pales in comparison to what it is to get a payday loan or an online loan of the kind that are offered to people that often charge triple digit interest rates. I talk in the book Watchdog about the fight we took on against the payday lending industry. It was a really deep and bitter fight. It led to a rule that we adopted to rein in payday lending around the country by requiring them to make a reasonable assessment of whether people could repay their loans before making the loans. And they fought that tooth and nail. They continue to fight it. And under the current bureau, the current leadership is actually trying to undo that rule. Uh, and uh, that's an unfortunate direction. And I hope people will speak out against that effort. Uh, but that's something that'll probably be tied up in the courts for some time. Many states don't have payday lending. About a third of the states have no payday lending. The other two thirds do at very high rates. And in all states, there are these online loans that find their way into these states, sometimes illegally, but trap people into cycles of debt that are very destructive of their finances. I want to ask you my own follow up on that. And to anybody, if anybody knows the story in Washington state better, please uh, correct me or, or add some detail in our, in our question thread now. But Washington had its own run um, with uh, payday lending just a few years ago where there was a big push to try to regulate the industry. And I remember at the time being baffled by why a handful of legislators were willing to fight so hard for an industry that seemed so transparently um, allied against the interests, interests of their constituents. Um, and these were, in a handful of cases, some legislators who had otherwise pretty strong track records of service um, to, uh, to the underdog, for lack of a better way to put it. Can you talk a little bit about why, how payday lending has been able to... Uh, uh, develop its sort of beachhead in legislatures around the country and hold on in the states where it has managed to hold on? Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenon I've seen around the country and it's, it has two, two causes uh, here. Uh, the first is that uh, there are a lot of legislators who are supported by the payday lending industry through campaign contributions and other means. They have been very effective at throwing money around in the corridors of the legislatures in the state capitals around the country. That is part of it, okay? But another part of it, and, and realistically, is there's an argument here that having this kind of credit available, even at very high prices, is somehow helpful to people. Now, I personally don't agree with that argument, and at the Bureau, we did an analysis of millions of payday loans, and what we found was that they repeatedly trapped people into cycles of debt so that you got into a short-term loan, you thought you could repay it, you couldn't, you, you were gonna get stuck in it, you were gonna have to pay fee after fee to renew the loan every two weeks, 
And eventually you'd end up paying more in fees than you ever borrowed in the first place. It happens to people all the time uh, and, it, and it causes some problems. But they make this argument with a straight face that access to credit is always a good thing, even if some of that credit is terrible credit that is at such a high price and has such conditions on it that it ruins people financially. Uh, and that was that was the problem I had with it was the evidence showed us that that was true for a lot of borrowers. Thank you. June asks, is there anything the CFPB can do to reduce the interest rates charged on student loans? It seems many people pay very high rates and their account balances increase over time, even when they make regular payments. Yeah, I, I talk in the book about how effective the CFPB could be in some of the different consumer finance markets and how the markets do differ from one another in significant respects. For example, in the mortgage market and the credit card market, the CFPB had broader authority to try to rein in bad practices, and we were pretty effective at that. The safeguards we put in place for the mortgage market were such that uh, it is difficult to think that we would ever have a financial crisis for the same reason ever again. And now as we're coming into this pandemic crisis, which is very different, uh, we have more options available for homeowners to stay in their homes and defer foreclosures. And we also have better rules and better mortgages uh, out there. So, uh, and we've safeguarded that market to a significant degree. There were two other markets I talk about in the book where we had a lot of troubles and that's because our authority was partial and not complete. One was auto loans, where we had authority over auto lenders, but not auto dealers. They got themselves carved out of the legislation because of their political muscle. And you, when you go to buy a car uh, and you get a loan, you often get it from a dealer, not from a lender directly. And that made it difficult for us to address that market. The other is student loans. We had authority over private student loans, but we had to work cooperatively with the U.S. Department of Education to deal with federal student loans. We had a great relationship under the Obama administration with Secretary Arne Duncan and then John King at the Department of Education. We worked effectively on some of these problems. But when Betsy DeVos came in under Donald Trump, she cut off all of that cooperation. Uh, she took over those issues. There hasn't been very effective work done for student loan borrowers who get into a lot of troubles managing that debt. In terms of the interest rate, which you asked about specifically, that's a law that would have to be changed by Congress. There have been good proposals in place to try to bring those interest rates down, key them off of the rates that banks themselves pay to access money uh, at the Federal Reserve discount window. Uh, something like that needs to be done on the same principle we had the question a couple moments ago about the debt collection statute in the state of Washington charging 12%. That's an outmoded law, should be brought up to date. These interest rates should be keyed off of current interest rates to keep people from being charged too much. Uh, that's a pretty good segue uh, into Betty's question, which is that she's concerned, concerned that the Trump administration is trying to take away much of the power of the, of the agency. I'm a realtor and I saw so many clients lose everything. What can you tell us about what is happening with the agency right now? Yeah, a good question. And by the way, uh, we did a lot of work with realtors at the Consumer Bureau because the mortgage market, the real estate market is, it's the biggest consumer finance market of them all. And everything we were doing potentially affected realtors and the way they make a living. And one of the things we found was that the reforms we were putting in place to especially avoid ambushing uh, buyers at the closing table was helping them be more satisfied and, and have fewer regrets and fewer problems after a uh, transaction closed. It, it, was a, it was a big problem that people would get ambushed at the closing table with new fees and new problems that had never been raised before, but now they're stuck. They're selling a house, they're buying a house, they don't have a lot of options. Often they just had to absorb any extra costs and very disgruntled, you know, take it or leave it, but pretty much have to take it. Uh, and we solved a lot of that. Realtors like that because realtors are based, their business is based on repeat business. They want satisfied customers, they want customers who look forward and, and look forward to their next house purchase, maybe moving up, maybe moving somewhere else around the country and aren't worried that they're gonna get screwed to adopt a technical legal term uh, at the closing table. And so that was an important change uh, that we made. Uh, but uh, in terms of, of realtors and others that the Consumer Bureau uh, dealt with, 
we tried to take a lot of input from them. Uh, we, we reached out to them a lot. We tried to understand exactly what challenges they were facing. When we had what we called the no before you owe mortgage rule, which provided more transparency around the mortgage transaction and the home sale transaction, that turned out to be a very good thing for consumers. And to go back to the very first question that was asked, a very good thing for the marketplace as well. Um, so uh, actually, who asked this question? I want to make sure I honor them. Dave Mentz wants to know, uh, then, what would you expect to occur or in the realm of consumer protection under a Biden administration? And I guess I'll just add, based on Biden's past work in the legislature um, or any scuttlebutt you might have heard about folks who might accrete to a Biden cabinet. Any thoughts about what, what his administration might hold? Yes, I do. Uh, Vice President Biden was a strong supporter of the Consumer Bureau. We worked with him particularly on student loans and on the whole middle class agenda that he headed up for President Obama during the administration. Uh, I remember, and I talk about it in the book, a particular uh, scene in which we were first bringing out the student aid shopping sheet to help people and their families, young people better understand what kind of decisions they were making about the cost of college and making hard-headed decisions about what loans they were taking on. And I remember and talked about how at the White House, we had a, an event for that. Uh, and it was Vice President Biden, Secretary Duncan, myself, and the heads of, of several uh, universities around the country, university systems. And Vice President Biden talked very poignantly about his own personal experience when he was getting ready to think about going to college uh, and his father's discomfort because nobody in his family had gone to college and his father wasn't comfortable, didn't, wasn't familiar with and felt awkward about the situation. You could feel, this is something very special about Vice President Biden, He's not lost that mentality of what it's like to be a middle-class kid growing up in a middle-class family. He very much feels that. And when he talks about these things, they're very personal to him. He would be a strong supporter of the Consumer Bureau. One of my reasons for writing this book is it is a roadmap to putting the Bureau back together and making it aggressive for consumers again. It has not been aggressive for consumers under the Trump administration. And that's been a mess. If you don't enforce the law, if you don't hold people accountable, uh, they will edge their way toward taking advantage of people, uh, and you need to do that. Uh, but I have no doubt that Vice President Biden, uh, as president, would feel strongly about supporting the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and I've had the privilege of, of advising some of his, him and his team on these types of issues. A roadmap suggests terrain that you know we can command or that we've got some experience in. I think it's safe to say we're in terrain right now we don't know very much about, and uh, uh, I think it's Dave Siminski's question. Uh, he wants to know, what are the three most important things the CFPB could be doing right now in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic to protect consumers? It's a great question, Dave. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about. I just, with two of my former colleagues from the Bureau, published a white paper about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's affecting consumers. And I called on the Consumer Bureau right now, the CFPB, to be much more aggressive about protecting consumers. Consumers need that right now. Consumers are in distress. Many of them don't have money coming in. They're getting behind on bills. They're not able to pay their rent or their mortgage. They're in danger of eviction or foreclosure. They're behind on auto loans and might have their car or truck repossessed, which for many people in many parts of the country is disastrous. And I talked about some of the things that can be done. And I tweeted about this and there's a white paper published and available, but let me just to answer your question very directly. What should the Consumer Bureau be doing? Right now, number one, it has tremendous access to real-time information. Most economic data comes with a lag. It takes months to collect, it takes months to organize and analyze, and it's always very much behind. The Consumer Bureau has a public complaint database where co co consumers pour in their problems and their issues day in and day out. And they can diagnose what's going on and understand the challenges people are facing and get that information to the rest of the government. That's something they need to be doing. Number two, they can't be going easy on the consumer finance businesses right now. If you let mortgage servicers off the hook from doing their jobs, then who will bear the brunt of that? It's the consumers that they don't serve effectively. 
So for example, right now under the CARES Act, almost half the little more than half the mortgage market is supposed to have access to forbearance if they can't pay their mortgage, can't make that payment this month or next month. But if the mortgage servicers aren't on the job, if they aren't answering the phone, if they're creating long wait times, if they're not following through, that relief won't get to people, middle-class families around the country. So it's not a time to ease off the mortgage servicers, it's time to put pressure on them to make sure they're doing their jobs effectively. And I also talk about debt collectors who are gonna be harassing Americans because many people are falling behind on bills and it's hard for debt collectors to collect. They collect on commission, so they don't get paid if they don't collect. So the amount of harassment and abuse is going to be magnified. It's already being magnified. And we need to think about how we hold debt collectors accountable to the standards in the law of decent treatment of the human beings who are the objects of their activity. Uh, that's at least three main priorities, although there are 16 different issues that we talk about in that white paper. And it's available on Medium uh, and, and otherwise, I think you can find it through the internet. We'll try to find a way to link to that in social media tomorrow, everybody. So I was gonna ask okay. you where we could find it. Um, All right. And so to round out this little um, sort of uh, band of questions, uh, how concerned or scared are you about the future existence or effectiveness of the CFPB in light of the Trump administration's efforts to cripple it? Can a Biden administration restore it to its full potency? Or yeah, any and this really, subsequent administrations? Yeah, this really traces some of the arc of the book, uh, Watchdog itself, because at the beginning, as I say, uh, the financial industry wasn't reconciled to the fact that there was going to be an agency that was going to be holding them accountable. And they started by blocking my nomination and arguing that there should be reforms made to the agency to weaken it or cripple it. That was true from the outset. And that dogged us, dogged our steps all the way through. Uh, but we had as our mentality that the right way to handle that was not to retreat and do nothing, which, which would have muted a lot of the criticism, but in fact, to be aggressive for consumers and show that we were making progress and let the public see that we were able to do things effectively to, to make them better off. We returned $12 billion to 30 million Americans over the six years that I was the director, which is money that had been wrongly taken from them that we put back in their pockets. That was really important work and it showed that government could be effective for, for the little guy, for the average family, not just for the big guys. They always have, have their lobbyists and lawyers on the job in Washington, but who's standing up for the average consumer? Uh, that was that was us. That was that was our job uh, to do that, and and so you know this is this is the roadmap that I was trying to set. And by the time I ended up stepping down toward the end of my term, and under the new leadership when they put the CFPB into retreat on a number of fronts, by the end of of a year or two, even Mick Mulvaney, who was a vehement critic of the Bureau and really a prejudiced partisan critic of the Bureau, he had to grudgingly acknowledge that the Bureau is here to stay and it's an important part of our government. And I believe that that is true. It is here to stay. It is an important part of our government. It can do more. It can do less. I believe it should be doing more, but I have no doubt that it's going to stay on the job. And what we need is we need a vigorous consumer Bureau that's standing up for people that's leveling that playing field and holding businesses accountable so that the better businesses have the benefit of having the law enforced against the worst businesses. That's really important in our society. Well, I'm sorry that I, I put your rousing climax in the middle of questions. We still have a couple left to go, but it is reassuring to know that you see a bright future ahead for the agency if we can weather this next little bit of time. I'm gonna, Erica's next question doesn't sort of easily sort of Fall into uh, fall into form. So I'm going to reframe it a little bit. She's wanting she wants to think of of elementary school public school students as consumers of education in our society, and has a question that's loosely about the balance of federal, state, and local funding. And if the if the CFPB, in its work with the Department of Education and Secretary Duncan, as you described, if you were able to make any advances or have any impact uh, on uh, on the fortunes of, of uh, public school uh, attendees across the country through the agency? 
Okay, I'm going to take that question in a particular direction because chapter eight of my book is all about personal finance education. I think this is an incredibly important subject. I think it's an essential subject for young people as they go through school and get to the point where they graduate and go out into the world, whether that is going into the workforce and suddenly being responsible for their own financial affairs or going to college where they immediately confront decisions about student loan debt that may dog them for years. And where do people get any guidance about how to manage their finances? Well, some people get it at home not nearly as many as we'd like. And in some of those homes, they're getting some of the bad lessons that their parents have, have run into problems with before them. And by the way, in many homes, there's not much said about finances because it's a sore subject for a lot of parents. You know, if they're on the edge and they know that they're fighting and they're anxious about their finances, about staying afloat and making ends meet, they don't want to talk about it really in front of their children. And so it's often a taboo subject. And so I talk in the book about how important it is at the federal, state, and local level that we promote financial education as an indispensable subject. What is the one subject that young people will need to know no matter where they go in life, no matter what field they're in, no matter what career they have? Uh, it isn't necessarily science. It isn't necessarily social studies. Uh, it is very much personal finance because whatever else they do, they're going to have to be able to manage their affairs, avoid making big mistakes, and try to put their best foot forward in providing for themselves and their families. We used to do a better job of this 100 years ago. I can show you textbooks that people showed me uh, from 100 years ago where a lot of the math questions in math class were all about uh, economic decisions and spending decisions in the household, or, or a lot of them had to do with farms because it was an agricultural economy then, and that was kind of a, a business. But we need to recognize that we need more personal finance education in the classroom, in all the other subjects, and we need probably a standalone course in high school so that people can really dig into this and understand it before they graduate. And every young person should have that education. What I did find at the Bureau was being a federal agency, it was hard to affect that as much as I would have liked because the curriculum is typically at the state and local level in the United States. And particularly for a federal agency that wasn't an education agency, we were the Consumer Bureau, not the Education Department. It was difficult to get people to listen. I tried to, to help uh, state level public officials uh, team up with us to promote this in their own states. And some states are making progress on this, but it's been slow. And by the way, there's worldwide test results, I talk about this in the book, that show that the United States is behind some of the other countries that have done more in this area. If we keep at this and keep at this for a number of years, we will strengthen consumers, households will be stronger, they will be more solvent, they will have a better future, and the economy will be stronger. There's no question about that. That's something we need to do in the United States of America today. You see, I'm capable of many rousing climaxes in answering. I know. I'm going to give you two more opportunities here. So <laughs> I have another question from Dave Siminski. It's a great one that dovetails right into what you where you just left us. Is there a right balance of consumer education, regulation, and enforcement that will truly protect consumers in the way that uh, Warren and Dodd Frank intended? Like, do you have a balance in mind? You know, that, that's a that's a kind of deep philosophical question. And when you ask about what people intended. You know, what we found was we started from a piece of legislation that's basically words on a piece of paper about what the Consumer Bureau should be and what its mission was and what its objectives were. We had to actually turn that into something that was flesh and blood, you know, build an agency from scratch. That was a, that was a big part of what I talk about in the book was that the massive nature of that undertaking. And we had a lot of decisions to make about what directions to go. We could have done this. We could have done that. We could have done this this way. We could have done it that way many forks in the road along the way. And again, that's why I wanted to have this book out there as a roadmap to what we were doing and why and, and how and what choices we were making and why we made them. Uh, but, but what I would say is that there, is, there are sort of four main tools that the Bureau used. There's education and there's improving disclosures to the consumer so that people have a clearer sense. We called it no before you owe. There's a chapter on that in the book. There's also more compulsory tools that, that bite more with the financial companies. Regulation, where we're actually changing the law that they have to live under. 
and enforcement and supervision where we're actually compelling them to do things by making sure that they're not violating the law. And the industry always wants to push the regulators in the direction of more education and more disclosure. And by the way, over the years, more disclosure has become almost a, a, a travesty and a caricature of itself. You see these contracts now with so much fine print going on for 10 or 20 or more pages. People can't really read it. They can't really understand it. It's often pitched, by the way, at like a 15th grade reading level when they know the average reading level is much less than that for the average American. So it's designed not to be understood. Uh, and, and so the industry wants to push the agencies in those directions. We felt that it was important for us to use all of our tools. As I say in the book, we sort of, we called them on education and disclosure. We were working in those areas, but we raised them on enforcement and regulation by making sure those tools were being used as well. Um, because I just can't bear to let this conversation end. I'm going to actually insert a, a question of my own, which is given your experience and the tenacity you showed to stay in the game against stiff resistance um, from folks who did not want the agency to have a launch to the way we see uh, dedicated um, career government officials and civil servants uh, treated and um, and mistreated uh, in the current climate in Washington. Uh, do you have, do you have, is our, is, is our, is, is our governing class, is the deep state that David Rode is going to talk about tomorrow night, going to be willing to sort of come back into government, do you think, after what we're experiencing in four years of the Trump administration? Will people be willing to take on the kinds of hard challenges that you took on to establish this agency and to help us rebuild a government in the wake of three and a half years of dismantling? That's a great question, Ware, and, and several aspects of response to it. The first one is there are a lot of people in government, and this should always be understood, and people should, should understand and respect it. There are a lot of people in government who are true public servants. They understand that public power is to be used for the public good. And they went into the public sector in order to be public servants and do something that helps in our society and makes things better for other people. I talk uh, at times about my parents who worked with the developmentally disabled uh, for their careers. It wasn't all that glorious a work. It wasn't running for office. It wasn't getting renown. It was just getting up and going to work every day to make things better for someone else. Whether or not it was appreciated, whether or not it was understood, that was the job. And that's what real public service is about. And plenty of people in government have that. Some people are just time servers. They're, they're just there to get a paycheck. It's true in every walk of life. But many people in government are real public servants, and they deserve our support and our respect. I will also say that in the wake of the last three and a half years, a period where the leadership in the federal government has not respected the government, hasn't understood the government, and hasn't tried to support the government so that when we now have come into a crisis where we needed a government response that was effective and that was timely and that was powerful, we didn't have it. Uh, we've come to see and pay the price for this hollowing out of the government uh, that has been so dramatic and so uh, ill-timed and so unfortunate. I think there are a lot of people with the public service mentality who are itching to get back in there and set things right because they are really patriotic people who believe in America and know that in America, the government is not the problem. It's not the enemy. It needs to be our ally and a supporter. That's what I talk about with the Consumer Bureau. It can really help middle-class Americans and should, and that's what the government should be. The third piece of that, and my last part of the answer is, there's lots of other dedicated public servants, not in the federal government, but in the state and local governments. And they are doing their darndest right now to make up for things that are not happening in Washington. It's best when we cooperate together. When I was at the Bureau in Washington, we worked closely with state attorneys general and with state financial regulators. We worked with local officials like mayors on some of these consumer issues, financial empowerment uh, and the like. Uh, but if, if we can get everybody rowing together, that's for the best. Uh, even even when that's not happening, the state and local officials can pick up a lot of slack 
and they are doing that around the country, and I'm really proud of them. And by the way, there's a cadre of former CFPB people who are now in state positions, and they are making a big difference in their communities across the country. That's great. I'm buoyed thinking that, hoping that uh, it will still be attractive for people to want to serve out of the sense of duty that you're describing on the other side of the treatment that people are receiving right now um, at every level of government, but especially in the other Washington. As for our last question, I will turn to Joe, Joe H., who says, my senators and representative in the House are aligned with your thinking. What else can I do as someone concerned about these issues to help make positive changes for consumers? That's a good question. And it you know, goes back to being a good citizen of the country and an activist. Uh, your voice matters. You can speak up and speak out and, and be supportive of these efforts. Uh, you know, if you help give visibility to this book, Watchdog, it will create more awareness among the public in this country and more of a groundswell of support for that agency, not just for it to exist, but for it to do its job the way it's supposed to do it. Uh, and you can provide a groundswell of support for public servants across the country. Another thing you can do is when you have a problem involving any aspect of your, your finances or your credit, file a complaint with the Consumer Bureau. Many people do that, tens of thousands, 30,000 each month do that. And it gives the Bureau a real bird's eye view of exactly what's affecting you in your community. It's important data. As I say, it became the voice of the consumer funneled right into the middle of that agency and kept us on task of knowing what we should do to address the problems of people around the country. So, but I would say political advocacy, political support, uh, and also a, an awareness of, of why this is so important and helping others be aware matters enormously. And, and, it, and believe me, it, it makes a difference. And every time people would say to me that, uh, in fact, one of the things I talk about in the book, kind of funny was when we would get money back for people, they often were curious and uncertain what this was. And if they got a check in the mail from this CFPB that they'd never heard of, they would sometimes contact us to ask if this was some sort of scam. And we were happy to reassure them that this was one check that they can and should cash and that we were on the job trying to work for them. People were always surprised uh, to get their money back and to know that somebody had done a lot of work to go to the trouble of making that happen for them. That's cool. Um, these aren't oversized foam publishers clearinghouse checks. These are bona fide. These are legitimate. That's cool. And I'm assuming that those were um, a complaint that might have been lodged through another through another channel, through a, a legislator or a representative or someone that found its way to you and then you circle back. And so suddenly you're in the picture for them in a way they didn't even know you were working on their behalf. That's true. And then, by the way, I talk in the book about the irony of some of the members of Congress who would complain loudly about us in public, but send their constituent complaints to us in private of course. so that we could yep. work them out. For them. <laughs> yeah, of course. Some things will never change. Um, Mr. Cordray, I want to thank you so much uh, for your service and for uh, convincing me at least that it is going to be possible for folks to want to continue to serve in your fashion on the other side of whatever we're all enduring right now. Um, and I want to urge everybody who has uh, listened uh, to Rich speak tonight to uh, pick up a copy of Watchdog um, and get the rest of the story. Uh, uh, and for that, to his point, to be itself a statement that that the values that are enshrined in the agency and in this roadmap are actually things that matter to us as consumers and as as citizens of the country. I want to thank also uh, Shane, Josh and Jimmy for making the program uh, technically possible tonight. Uh, and I want to let you all I want to urge you all to join us again tomorrow night to hear David Road in conversation with uh, um, Steve Scher. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Rich Cordray, and we will speak with you all very soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.